Imagine this cell. We are composed of cells, you know, trillions of cells. But uh, we take one cell out of there. We take one cell which is like the same as all the other cells. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing with the cells is there is an inner and an outside world. There's a protective shield outside world of the cell and then there is the inner world. If the, if the protective shield is not working well, then all kinds of stuff can get into the cell. And that means stress. That means it's because of oxidative stress and inflammation in our daily lives and bacterial uh, stress, uh, viral stress, biological stress, emotional stress, mental stress. It's all stress, cell biological stress and it gets into our cells. And now our protective shield around the cell has been like jeopardized. Our lifestyle is too much comfort. We seek too much comfort. There's no stimulation. There is no exposure to the elements of nature. It's all protected through houses, cars, through clothes. All the time, everything is like covered, covered and de-stimulated. Because of the, uh, we, our physiology from uh, uh, millions of years ago was exposed to the elements of nature. So our physiology actually is built to be stimulated, to endure and to uh, activate inner mechanisms that are able to endure and to neutralize the impact of environmental stress. Yet now, because of our comfort zone behavior, we live without stress, but the stress is uh, it now coming in in different ways than the environmental stress, uh, 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 which is uh, in our mind. And that is emotional, mental stress, daily stress, congest uh, congestions, uh, we have to do this, we have to do that. We uh, ignite our bodies to do work, 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 while our body actually is not prepared to take on so much stress. We become feeble, we become, uh, you know, a burns, a burnout, uh, inflammatory diseases. In 2014, I showed uh, to be able to get a bacteria injected, which normally makes you very sick. It's a controlled experiment. It's called the endotoxin experiment. And 16,000 people prior to me, they all became sick when injected with that bacteria for uh, between three to six hours. And then I came and within 50 minutes, I had it within my control. And then they said, no, but you, you are the Iceman. You climb Mount Everest in your shorts, the, the Kilimanjaro in record times, in shorts, and, uh, 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 beyond the polar circle, you run marathons, uh, and you run them even barefoot in midwinter, uh, beyond the Arctic circle, and in the desert, and you hang by one finger in the air, and then uh, in midwinter, and, uh, and you stand for two hours in the ice, all all those miraculous records and uh, the superhuman and all that. No, I have been testing my body in environmental stress. Outside in nature, activated therefore deeper mechanisms inside and they work the way nature meant it to be. And now we found a way to biohack into the body and give people an autonomy sense of autonomy over the immune system, vascular system, lymphatic system, endocrine system, all the systems. Because that's the way we are built, but we forgot. We lost. Uh, we lost the connection because of comfort zone behavior too much. And it is very nice. I love watch hours and I love comfort. But at a certain moment, I really had enough of it all. I need to go or I want to go really hard to the cold water, swim and be in deep meditation, deep 
connection and deeply letting go my mind and let the body take over and it results in such a graceful being being powerful being there beyond thoughts just in the here and now and that's sanity that's meditation skin and my skin temperature did not go down because I did not want it to go down. You see what I mean? Right. That, it, that is the connection with the stress mechanisms in the body and just by the power of thought, which is neurology, you ignite and activate the neurology in the rest of the body to be able to endure physical stress at command of the will and that is where mm. our future will go if there is one thing i want to do in this world is to relieve the unnecessary uh, t a terrible stress of people who uh, are suffering from mental disorders. In short, uh, we are capable, just by the power of will, we are connect well through environmental stressful exercise. That means hormesis. That's the new exercise going to be hormetic exercising. That to connect. Who's that word? Hormesis is like acute self-inflicted stress like fasting could be or going into the cold or doing breathing exercises wherein you do retentions you stop breathing at a certain moment that is very stressful for the body well you feel completely in control acute stress self-inflicted and that is consciously done and, uh, and anybody can do that hey it's a tool and the tool is for you, it's your choice. It is not a dogma behind, there is no dogma behind. And there is no uh, uh, long exercising practices needed. Within a half hour, you can see it and feel it for yourself. And then you use it whenever you are in stress and you are uh, the victim of the stress, uh, to take control over the stress and to make it go away. I lost my wife in uh, 95 uh, through a suicide. She kissed uh, her four kids goodbye just before jumping from eight stories down. There I was. Mm. I was working at the time in the, in the mountains as a mountain guide uh, to get some money. And, uh, and she was with the family, uh, the Spanish family. And, uh, was there in the mountains and uh, she did that at uh, like uh, half past one in the morning uh, and, and, uh, well, mm. what is that it, it's like uh, was left behind with four kids a broken heart and it's irrational it's eating you alive uh, you can't cannot not think about it you cannot uh, not indulge into it 
it's uh, it's real and now i know how it works but at the time uh, but the only time i could find a relief uh, stop the thinking was going into ice water ice water and breathing exercise deep mm. breathing exercise and then uh, uh, now i know uh, that the deep breathing exercises and uh, the cold uh, both able to change gene expressions in uh, in our cell and uh, through these exercises these the hormesis the hormetic exercising of breathing plus the cold we are also able to tap into the deepest of our brain at will that's exactly mm-hmm. where emotions reside grief reside you ask me the purpose of grief is the, if there is any there is absolutely a great purpose but uh, back then i was very uh, uh, very powerless in, in, in what was happening it was all a process she was going down the whole of psychiatry could not help her and uh, nobody actually could uh, help her she was a beautiful person very vital very alive and then uh, a shadow came in and it uh, uh, went uh, became bigger and bigger and bigger and we nobody uh, not me i could not stop it and i, I didn't see it coming as well um uh, yeah. that, that's where I, i had to deal with with something unknown and even unknown in psychiatry so there i was <laughs> the, at that moment i could only stop my mind of go when you go into the cold water you don't think you just survive yeah it, it, it right. is you you are just there but that gave me a break of this loop and that that healed me because the loop is eating you alive it wants you uh, actually to break the loop but i could not but the cold water did it uh, cold water gave me that relief and the breathing exercises they were able to tap into that area of emotions in, in the deep in the depth of the brain i did that for years for years on my own because i had nobody around me i had very little money i had to take care of four children alone and that, that, uh, that, but i was becoming quite vital and happy and uh, uh, without thought i was taking care i created a new nest Uh, the purpose of life was there okay she was not there but so i got to live for two and i had the energy of two and it nature has the capacity not only to heal but also take on the purpose of those who left it becomes subconscious it is w- deeply within and it's there your brother is still there he, he is here and he is here around us like my mother is around me she is gone uh, out of her body but in metaphysical sense they uh, the energies are st- never gone the soul is never mm. gone that we are not schooled in that that we do not understand i know i have experienced it and of course the whole world was not built to uh, use uh, natural methods to make people to heal people to get to their soul to their purpose to their core to the sanity 
No, make pills, make medicines, make dependency, make therapies, make hospitals, make whole infrastructures of dependency and slave the people to get money. It's wrong what is happening, but I put that aside. I just come with here with a positive message that the purpose of those who have gone and their lives is never gone. That, that we are able to realize, to make manifest, there is a purpose for everything. We only need to learn to tap in deeply enough. They talk about the unlimited power of the mind, and yet we cannot handle our minds uh, to become happy, strong and healthy. Hey, what's the matter? We are here able to shoot people to the moon, to Mars, but not to become happy, strong and healthy here and know our purpose? Hey man, let's go back. Let's go back. Because we lost something. And that what we are lost, it is found. Nothing is needed. You are perfect the way you are. But not if it is systematically schooled to become this, that, that. You have to do this. Restrictive, narrowing consciousness creating. Blocks, building blocks that serves a system that serves only a couple of people. And they are not even happy. So uh, we have to go away from that. The future paradigm, and I'm showing this in very simple techniques, and it sounds like mega, uh, 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 whatever, you know, like I'm talking like, uh, uh, wow, he's talking so far out, man. No, I'm talking into the DNA. I'm talking about inflammatory markers. I'm talking about the depth of our brain being accessible and all scientifically endorsed. It's all there, but it began with the belief that, uh, that war, abuse uh, 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 of humanity and cruelty to animals, pollution, uh, exploitation of this earth, and uh, keep on going with negativity, that that is normal? I think it is sick, and I'm going to do something about it. Every day I go swimming outside, I say, I got a day. I got to die once a day. When I go into the cold, you just gotta let go of these thoughts and the indulging and all. Just let it go because you're gonna go in the cold and the cold, and your thoughts they produce nothing more than a certain degree of inflammation into your body. Let it go. <laughs> let the body do what the body is capable of, and feel that it is alive. And that's what I do. If you uh, look at, at the way the uh, people see their differences, they don't see the soul. They don't see happiness, strength, and health to be owned by every individual. No, they see differences. They say, yeah, you are an American, I'm a Dutch guy, and then you got Japanese, and you got Australians, and you got the Russians, and uh, etc. cetera, and uh, political, racial, uh, 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 vegetarianism contra uh, uh, people we meet uh, uh, thousands of differences that's where they got lost in, in their mind and until the body and happiness and just mere unconditional love feeling it and being it is not done we have to keep on cleansing cleansing and it's gonna be it's nice to cleanse because when it, you feel yourself clean and that's what I feel afterwards I feel I'm just there and I'm most grateful just to be there and not to be clouded by all kinds of thoughts listen there is no dogma with this this is no religion but you should be divine feeling divinity within yourself and if it is not cleanse yourself I got some tools man you go into the cold which is very good to tackle cardiovascular related diseases, conditions, killer number one in our society, Western society it is. Well, to tackle it, a cold shower a day keeps the doctor away. How simple is it? So that's what I tell people in, in this almost funny way. I want to bring something very important that we are not 
really alive in our uh, uh, right condition in our vascular system cardiovascular system it's our heart and 125,000 kilometers which is about 70,000 miles of vascular channels vessels like capillaries uh, arteries and veins it's all inside if the skin is ripped off you see all the vascular channels it's just rat rat uh, or color rat and uh, uh, it's where the fluid the life force is and it goes through and what do we do we cover it up while all the thermal receptors pain receptors and temperature receptors they end up in the skin they are connected they need stimulation then the millions of little muscles in the vascular system are going to be stimulated and they help the blood flow go through every minute what happens if you take a cold shower your heart rate goes down if you take regularly a cold shower uh, 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 then the heart rate goes down with 20 to 30 beats a minute to 24 hours a day that means stress is gone and then the vascular system with the millions of little muscles primitive muscles they are stimulated they become strong they help the blood flow and thus it reaches all the cells so much better and then a, a, a lot more uh, nutrients oxygen and vitamins to reach out you get a, more, a lot more energy so a lot more energy and a lot less stress that's what your body is you know the, uh, our feet we we put our laces and then yeah suffocate them all the day long <laughs> and we think that it's, it's normal and we walk we uh, walk around like dandies where, uh, look look how i constrict my body and let it not breathe beautiful huh beautiful huh you know sometimes we just need to let it go let uh, at least once a day be naked be like uh, uh, the way nature meant it to be and let environmental stress uh, touch you a little let the omnipresence the cosmos the, the universe touch you and be there grateful for what you are and what you experience what is not in the books it's in nature nature has answers for anything only we have to reconnect with nature uh, uh, we are not in harmony with nature we don't give a fuck about the ocean it's full of plastics and it keeps on going and we keep on polluting we keep on exploiting and uh, the greed is keeping on going hey man uh, if that is the nature uh, uh, no it's wrong Anybody who lived before me, I know, like my fathers, my grandfathers, my nephews, who, whoever was gone, my wife, all those, I live for them. I live for them. My, my wife was so, hey, it's Frank Ocean. I, I'm just having a very nice conversation with a very nice man. I bless your life. I, I, I love you. I bless you. Thanks.
tomorrow You don't wanna cry, so You kept your eyes closed I could be great I'm on my way If I wanna escape I can escape We was on a date I took you to Mac Kisses That's like your favorite I don't like fried chicken I don't want no chicken for late And I don't need rob niggas Can't do that job for the date Coming out fig Turn off on gauge I had the M5 winner Hell, I should squat out the Jakes Race on a date Race is a date I know you lied to me You just don't lie to my face I can't be great, so I'm great for it You just want hate, you got gift for it You won't fight, you ain't built for that, huh? That roll call, you can see my hands Jaws gon' break Look on butt, she like I snuck up on me And ain't say nothing Bit it's my tongue gushed I couldn't see out huh. I ain't say nothing I used to play tough with the cops, had ideas. Twelve protests hold me a spot, and I'll go. Black folk know we're talking white me, but still, hold two open hands up in the sky, finger quotes. In my gang, the youth, my limbs used to swing like polo tees. My also saw a bottle like what we'll Puff did, Steve. You can't tote your own weight, then what's this bar shit even about? Crystals on your little feet, that's all that dust protein. Swoop your name from Calabasas in the British Boys car. We used to sight flam, all Jacobs had the library card. The sky's a mirror, the silver spoons, the plastic knives and sparks. I was the dog, breathless, chasing a car up the street. If I ever catch it, I'll panic, that's the flaw in me. Nothing ain't glamorous about growing up poor Naive, standing on the balls of my feet Trying to pray before I sleep and I'm like, red light, it's got a waterfall dish I'm a head on the cushion I think I'm reffing like green off someone like you Someone like me, ring finger, my show gets to me Wrist like sprains, natural sprains, water green head no could Other than me, you ain't nobody else coming between a cool stuff We got the camera on Monday, we made a movie on Tuesday, fuck We got the look, it looks, you never seen stars It's something too bright, 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 bright a lot, make dreams bleed in the days, the pressure couldn't stop the bleeding, I started seeing things, watching out for demons, black and like a screen these plays, I was always reading, yeah, there's some heaven when the sun was shining, I started feeling like pussy popping was the paradigm, get my way maritime, I'm very merciful, I eat, 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 all my friends is, oh, oh, lazy truck behind, oh, heroes in front of mine, this rapper's who evolved with time, conducted in all the rhymes, at that time, they enforced the bias, you know, it's some cops stopping, frisk the guy, cause he browns so close to size. All the gangs, his lane's exploded by. Switch lanes in a Porsche, I drive the police for these four or five. Sirens screaming like they four or five. Four attentions on a four or five. Still on the way, like I'm trying to gain. Don't hibernate in the winter, that's when summer bodies are made. Just like days, like a sprinter. With the Brian baby blue interior. Big bees like GMOs, and they sting on my eyes closed. All I see are my eyes closed. They want emo on time zones. It's the same, but different sex, twins, similar to this. I'm like, they're like, this, what if I dish? I'm ahead of the cushion. Like, think I'm ripping like me, I'm someone like you, someone like me, when my show gets to me. It's like springs, natural springs, but I'm in the Other than me, and you ain't nobody else coming between the group stuff. We got the camera on money. We made a movie on TV, fuck. We got the look, it looks, you never seen stars, it's all just right, right, right. Man, man, it's fit by the Asians, which by the rain, big for a friend. Big peak. Bust down face, keep up the tater hands I wanna see the money and cash so that I can truly grasp Thank you to save it, I did a favor before I pray in hands Speaking of God, at 10 years old, I switched church on Speaking of, speaking of God, speaking of God Maybe keep it at four though.
17 years old, I switched church homes, man. The bishop was speaking. How we a Baptist, so how you a bishop? Like, technically speaking, you drove a white rose. Me and my family was tight, bro. The difference between having a home and not having a home was a tight, bro. Visiting Catholic churches, the message was quiet as mice, so the minister spoke on no the microphone. They had no choir, so silent. I thought I heard Christ go, need a Messiah. Run out the house from homeless, you seven months pregnant with Ryan. I figured I'd go to the east by my teeth, but some peace and quiet. I ended up running the streets with my cousin, sitting in the back. Listening to beats, scheming on schemes that came to pass. They strategy murder yourselves and fall according to stats. I pray new plots, clear and thick, it's full of good glass. So much for the death is, the vicious of death. Keep shaking death, it's all the same like a new car you wanna buy. So it's popping up on your way to work, see it all the time, always passing by. Call it playing beetle bug, yeah, it's always like, better throw a punch. Running late to cheat the world, made a plain weight, cause no rush. Toss for no emotions from above. Look like bubbles on a tub. Like, mm, 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 Microdosing, 
microdosing and it allows you to do whatever you normally do a little easier, a little um, more comfortably. There's a book out by Eric Waldman called A Really Good Day. And that's one of the definitions of someone microdosing. They say, gee, I had a really good day. And one of the reports I've gotten had it said this way. It says, I had a really good day. I got some work done that I hadn't wanted to do. Um, I was nice to the people in the office, even that person who didn't deserve it. Um, after work, I, at the gym, I noticed I did one more set of reps. Then I completely forgot I'd taken a microdose. So right. it's, it's not... You know, the universe doesn't shatter. Uh, it just, uh, maybe it smiles a little bit. Yeah, I mean, when someone says, I want a drink, you don't hand them a bottle of a bottle. That's a dose problem. <laughs> so, um, the microdoses are, are a tenth or a twentieth of what people now call recreational dose, which is in, in LSD terms, um, recreation is about 100 micrograms. Micrograms are a million of a gram, so we're talking very little. A microdose is 7 to 12 micrograms, means about a, um, a tenth of that. And with psilocybin, we're talking mushrooms. Um, a trip, a fairly serious trip, is 3 to 5 grams. Mushroom. That's one of those shake your universe trips. A microdose is a tenth of a gram to maybe four tenths of a gram. And the range is big because different species of mushrooms have different amounts of psilocybin in them, and different mushrooms in the same batch have different amounts. And so when people are microdosing, um, they they learn what's what's best for them, and it's in that range. Now, I should also say really early on, um, microdoses are not taken every day. Underline, not taken every day. Um, what I've recommended for the past 10 years when people ask is take it on day one, take two days away from it, and then take another dose if you're, if you're planning to work with yourself um, for some time. Yeah, high doses. No, no, spend it there. <laughs> um, I think one of one of my questions is maybe a bit high level, but no pun intended there either. Um, it, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm curious about how you think of a trip and what you think is happening there. Okay. When you're having a high dose, one of the things that people notice is they want to lie down because walking around gets to be tricky. What over the years people have suggested, and it's true in all the research, people then will be given eye shades so they can go inside, and they'll also be given music. And the kind of music they're given turns out to be very important. Because as you come into the the inner psychedelic trip, the music serves as a guide. So the sad music will bring on sadness, and vast orchestral music will bring on a sense of expansion. And the only genuine rule for music is impossible, no lyrics, because your brain is going way faster than words. And when people begin to do that, they usually will record a long period of just beautiful themes, beautiful images or beautiful geometrics, fractals, kind of exploding fountains of light. This gorgeous visual imagery. Um, and, you know, it's one of the reasons when you go to a concert and there's a fantastic light show, they're trying to reproduce a little bit of what you're getting from the psychedelic. That feeling of amazement in this kind of visual. But it's all with your eyes closed. And then what happens is you begin to uh, detach from
and you begin to explore the kinds of um, experiences that you only read about in poetry and mystical literature. So people will say, I, I was, I, I remembered my own birth. Or, I was, I felt the whole creation of the world. Or even people say, you know, I, I could go back to the beginning of time and be part of the Big Bang. Now, it isn't clear what they're really experiencing, but what they're reporting is a feeling beyond their own identity. And there's a term called transpersonal, or true or beyond the person. Where this, these experiences clearly aren't about you. They're about, uh, they're in the, they're kind of in the universe. You're feeling the way the whole universe is behaving. It's kind of like, um, you go down the ocean, and the waves are individual, but not for long. And they have much more of an identity with the whole ocean. So what you're getting with a high trip is remembering that you're part of the ocean. Now again, when that all occurs, and if, and if, it, and if you're in a safe and comfortable setting, that can be very beautiful. If you're in an unsafe and uncomfortable setting, it can be terrifying. One of the examples is if you're in a safe setting and you have this feeling that you're going to die. And in some sense, um, your ego is. It's not going to die, but it's going to become less important. So you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And you are sitting in this, you know, in this room and you take off the tail and you sit up and you say, I'm going to die. And you're, you, have a, you have a guide, which is very important. I do. You have a guide or a man. And they say... Just go with it. And you say, but I'm going to die. And they say, oh, yeah, I know. I heard what you said. It's all right. Just the old train, old train. And inside of you, what you're it does, feeling it does. well, I thought I was going to die, but my friend seems to know what he's doing. I remember I've taken a drug. Maybe I'll just lie down and see what happens. <laughs> and it turns out that when you get to the other <laughs> side of that, um, it's in a sense of enormous peace and gratitude. Um, people describe the universal energy, and, this, and I've heard it over and over, and I see it in classic texts as well, is it's closer to love than anything. It's not negative, it's not cold. It's kind of accepting. So that's a, a, a very brief run through what most people say is one of the most important experiences of their whole lives. Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. If you if you live, say, in Indiana, which is a pretty flat piece of country, and then they blindfold you and they take you to the edge of the Grand Canyon, they let you down on top of the glacier. You're you're aware that you're you're prior world in Indiana was really small and that there's an amazingly large and graphically different possibilities in this world. So yeah. you then are brought back blindfolded again, brought back to Indiana. And if there's no one in Indiana who's ever been to the Grand Canyon or been on a glacier, eventually you might get talked out of it. If there's right. other people would say, oh yeah, and there was something about that glacier, you know, that I just can't explain, uh, but I know what you mean. Uh, then you, then you get it, then you, then you can make use of it. A psychedelic experience is, is more than your mind can handle, okay? But you can recall that you were in a state where you could handle it. You know, then if you start reading, um, like mystical readings from almost any religious tradition, they all read the same. And you, people who've had psychedelics read that stuff and they say, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about. I know what she's talking about. And before, you don't. Forgive how, like, free associated this might feel, but <laughs> when, uh, I, I think you, you're familiar. I was working in uh, Malibu this summer, 
and I would go out like pretty late from the studio and there's like a big population of coyotes in Malibu and then you know, when I would go outside I would see like all these bunnies running around and it reminded me of video games where you're like a wizard or something you're on this you're playing this role in this game and you're running around and you have like you're doing, like, things to pick up and put in the pouch you know, and I was like oh they're in the game and they have to like catch these rabbits in their role in the game and I think some, for some reason like psychedelic and other discoveries in this role that we play these roles that we play feel like those things we pick up and put in the pouch or you know or consume or whatever that uh do what they do to us like in and whatever those things are that we find on our way one of my close friends is uh, from the hardcore like punk community and, and he prides himself on being straight edge he does drink coffee, but that's about it. And, and and so when we talk about these things, it's like, no, 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 I, I don't use my brain as intended, you know, like as intended. Even smoking a blunt, I'll feel like I'll be reminded of mortality and be oh, terrified. We you know. know. Well, and, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, but right at the edge of being terrified, Right at the other side of that is, oh, it's only death. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ram Dass, um, one of his last um, interviews before he died was, he was talking about dying, and he was saying, well, yeah, it's death, birth, death, birth. Research days, we had some people who were alcoholics. Um, a couple sent by the courts, a couple just came in. And what we saw is we would give them the same basic treatment, and we would give them, say, 400 micrograms of LSD, which makes most people really want to lie down. And at 400 micrograms, these guys would be walking around saying, hey man, I don't know what's going on, it's kind of feels weird. So we, we found that with alcoholics, they were so used to handling an altered state that we had to give them more. So we gave them like 800, which is, I do not recommend. Um, and they would have the same basic experience of letting go to themselves and seeing themselves in a larger way. And they would almost all come back and feel that their body really needed to be respected and that their drinking wasn't working for, for their body. This is true of smoking as well. But almost all of them, uh, within a week, would go out and get loaded. Okay? Right. And then they would come back to us and say, hey, what did you do to me? We said, well, what did we didn't do anything. We just gave you a psychedelic to enjoy our experience. They said, but drinking doesn't feel good. Because what they felt was they could feel the way your life shrinks when you drink. It doesn't get bigger. And I, I watched a, a film of a guy who 40 years ago, one of the last people before the government shut it down was an alcoholic, went through a program in um, Spring Grove, Maryland. And he'd been a serious alcoholic. He was in his like, maybe early 30s. He was losing his wife, he was losing his job, his kids were mad at him, um, he was sick a lot, and he couldn't stop. But he had the psychedelic, he had this experience, and he stopped drinking. Now, the filmmaker says to him, um, have you ever, you know, what, what's your drinking now? He says, I've never, I haven't drunk a drop in four years. And the filmmaker starts to ask him about his willpower, and the guy laughs. He says, it's not willpower. I lost interest in drinking. That's a different kind of 
letting go of an addiction. There's a, well, some research published on chronic smokers. To get into the study, you had to have 20 years or two packs a day, and you try to hold on to treatments. So these were hardcore, couldn't stop smoking smokers. And of the first 12, 11 of them were absent, had stopped smoking for at least the first six months. And when they started to look at who did better and so forth and who lasted longer, they found that the, the more clearly they had what was called a mystical experience, the more likely they were to have quit full turkey and never look back. And, and I had an early report of microdosing, which is not, not quite as hard for about three or four years back a day. Um, but he said, I wanted to stop smoking, and I thought microdosing would help. So within about two microdoses, you know, a couple of days apart, he noticed that he wasn't smoking. And he continued microdosing for other reasons. And um, I checked in with him. It was about five years ago. I checked in with him recently, and he, he had some interesting stories, but he, he'd never smoked since. So both microdosing, when you are clear with intention, and high doses for very, very, very serious cases seem to help people stop smoking. Yeah, and these are all people who, who want to. U.S. culture kind of doesn't doesn't allow us much grief. There's a whole side of it, you know, buck up. You know, you're not dead, get on with it. And that's really nuts. So that, so that being allowed to grieve, and it's because you, you're your brother, you miss him. He's out of your life. Your mother feels much, much, you know, differently as only parents can. So if we're allowed to grieve, usually people get get what they need from, from grieving, from feeling, allowing their feelings just to flow. But when you're, when you can't grieve, or you keep grieving what you feel is too long, then it may be helpful to get a different perspective. Um, the question for me when someone says they want to take a psychedelic is a little bit like someone says, hey man, I want to be in a relationship. And I say, well, let's, what kind of relationship and with who and how's it going to work and so forth, rather than, oh, you know, there's some guy in the corner who says, hey, I'll sell you a relationship. When you get right. benefit from a high-dose psychedelic ayahuasca or LSD or anything, you stop. Because you yeah. you need to, um, to make use of it, to integrate it get some benefit from it to make your life better. And if, while you can't get addicted in the traditional sense of addictive drugs where you have to take more and more and more to get less and less hit, you can become uh, kind of habituated to, rather than solve your problems, is you'll just get high. Indeed. It's hard to misuse um, psychedelics, but hey, people are wonderfully creative. Do you think it was just prudent or uh, a conservative leaning set of ideals or, or or do you think it was what do you think made the government stop uh, oh <laughs> okay that well it would be nice to have something nice to say at this point but i don't <laughs> because we actually know uh, we actually know because one of nixon's close colleagues who went to jail etc said it very clearly. It was never about the drugs. Nixon declared the war on drugs because it was a way of getting at the people he hated, people who, who were against the war and people who were against him. And it was predominantly the hippies who were against the whole culture. And it was, it was blacks 
That was where the marijuana was most used. And it was a way where you could bust people um, for something that was either harmless or beneficial. And you didn't have to say what you were really after was breaking up their, their political social groups. Now what happened is, um, the medical people kind of went along with it and started to, to come up with all the reasons that it was dangerous. And it, and it, like everything else, misused, it was dangerous. I mean, there's a, there's a, there was this wonderful poster that the marijuana people used to use before things got so legal where the causes of death and the top of it would be like um, alcohol and be 400,000 people a year, heart disease, so forth. And then as you went down, it'd be less and less and less. And way down at the bottom of the chart, two from the bottom was deaths from peanuts, about 100 a year. And then below that was marijuana. Deaths from marijuana, zero. Right. So psychedelics, in spite of their incredibly powerful effect on your mental life, are curiously incredibly safe drugs. And there's this wild uh, little paper that came out where somebody reported on someone had taken not a not a uh, microdose but a full dose, only five times as much as you should take, and another person who had 50 times what you should take. And another person who had several thousand. They didn't do it on purpose. Now, all of these three people, first person just had a very weird time. The person with 50 was hospitalized for a few days, as was the person with several thousand. But they were hospitalized because they were pretty much out of it, comatose. They all physically recovered 100%. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker on that one. The, the person with 50 and the person with a couple of thousand both had had chronic mental illness. And in both cases, their chronic mental illness was alleviated, was taken, was, was basically healed. Now, nobody is recommending this, but it, it, it certainly is a strange kind of, of drug if taking a huge amount of it doesn't harm you. What cures you? Science, not a, you know, we not we, a recommendation to take it out. Yeah, I, no recommendation. Now, <laughs> now, let me go back to Nixon a moment, because there's one other piece. Um, Schedule one, as it's called in the federal um, rule book, are drugs that, quote, um, have no medical use and a high propensity for addiction, of which cocaine and heroin uh, are, are obvious and, and speed. Now, at the time it was put on Schedule One, no medical use. Um, it was the single LSD was the single most researched psychiatric drug in the world. When I became a researcher, you know, as I talked to you earlier, um, as a graduate student, I wrote Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, who made LSD, and said in my kind of naive way, "Is there? Can you send me any information?" And I got back two volumes, about a thousand, uh, of the first thousand studies, the first thousand studies. And they only sent me the abstract, just the first page of each study. The fact is that it had escaped the universities, it had escaped the laboratories, it had escaped the medical world. People all over the country were taking LSD, and one of the main things they came up with is they didn't like war. They did like ecology. They did like um, racial justice, and the Nixon administration found a way to stop it. So much for science. Are you a fan of uh, putting us in the <laughs> Well, <laughs> I confess, you know, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Uh, I mean, I, I do know a lot of people who put psilocybin mushrooms in chocolate, and part of it's because mushrooms taste bad. Um, no, I'm actually not, because with LSD, you're dealing in millions of a gram. It's hard to get what a millionth of a gram is. Um, you can easily balance a millionth of a gram on, on the tip of the pin, okay? 
and right. it's important to know how much you're taking. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, there was a New York Times reporter when, when edibles were just coming in, and she was in Denver, and she took, um, you know, a square of a chocolate bar of, of marijuana edibles. And as people do, she didn't feel much, so she ate all of it. And she spent the next eight hours lying on the floor of her hotel room, wondering if she was ever going to be willing to tell the story. So um, right. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with edibles, but, but I've noticed the labeling is getting clearer and clearer about, you know, don't overdose. And with psychedelic, with LSD, which is still illegal, um, yeah, I'd prefer that people would, would have it on a on a tab or piece of piece of little blotter paper. But they have some idea how much they're taking and how to how to be, be more careful. Oh, legalization. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's inevitable. Uh, the the reason is not because uh, we're seeing that it's helpful. That's helping. And now there's a lot of decent medical research. But what there is now is about 15 companies all racing into what is called now the psychedelic space as a, a, a business term. And they're all busy promising incredible um, payback for investing in their companies should LSD become legal. And um, they're all, uh, they've all made big gains since they were on the market. A lot of them are penny stocks. And the fact is that the medical uses are very, very clear now. And it, it, it's hard to be a government that says, I really want to keep more people mentally ill. And even more, you don't in the United States, you don't want to stand up and say, I, I don't mind that, that, that more soldiers have committed suicide since Iran and Afghanistan than we lost in the world wars. And that if there's a substance which would help vets not kill themselves, it's really hard for a politician to be against. So there's the forces of good, which is it can really help, particularly severe depression and post-traumatic stress. And there are companies who know how to make money and they know how to get around, you know, to, to get, they, they're now lobbyists. You know, pressuring the government towards legalization. So all of a sudden, uh, and this is described in the, if you uh, if you look at that kind of stock market uh, literature, it's called the Wild West of psychedelic stocks. And um, I have no idea how it's going to come out. Worldwide, there's an awful lot of depression. Now there's an awful lot of sorrow. I mean, the world is tough, but there's depression on top of that. Antidepressants don't make you feel better. They make you feel less bad. And what a lot of people say is, yeah, they make you feel less bad and I, and it feels like I'm numb. Psychedelics work on depression totally differently. And people not only feel less bad, they feel more good. So yeah, legalization is inevitable and it will not happen in the United States first. It's almost happening in Canada right now. And there are substances which are which turn into LSD in the body. They're kind of LSD with an extra molecule. And they're available over the internet, legally, um, you know, in much of Europe, uh, much of Canada, etc. How will the rest of legalization roll out and will the United States you know, catch up. One more possible loop. Um, yeah, because I know who's listening. Um, one of the things that we found, and we is my little research team, and we've got about 3,000 reports from 51 countries about microdosing. And a lot of those are depression. And that's where I know the most. And that microdosing is the safest least dangerous and um, and you don't need a lot of professional help for depression. The pharmaceutical industry seems to be putting out some things that definitely have mixed reviews with everybody I've talked to.
<laughs> mixed reviews is a nice way of saying it. Yeah, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not worthless, but they're not very good. Kind of like going to a bad restaurant. You still get food. You saved yourself from, and this is a little strange, the depression that people get when they're on antidepressants. And it's that feeling of, of, oh, well, just bad things happen. There's nothing you can do about it. No, when you're not on that yeah, prison, yeah. when bad things happen, you feel terrible, but you, you, you know, you feel like doing something about it. It's a very great difference. Part of the reasons on this, you know, I've spent the last 10 years looking at microdosing is the amazing shift what people say after one or two microdoses is, I'm back. And I say, what do you mean? They say, I'm back, I'm me. I have feelings again, you know, and when you have feelings, of course, you have bad feelings too. But it's kind of like, you know, if someone said to you, hey, you know, I've got this great musical instrument. It just has a lot less of a range. <laughs> right, you don't have to worry about those high notes or those really low notes. We cut them off. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, but you can play most things on it. <laughs> And it sounds great. It really does. <laughs> well, it sounds okay. <laughs> and miss the highs and the lows. Uh, I am delighted to spend time with you. And who knows when we can all see each other in reality again, whether we'll find with me. You're listening to Blonde. 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 in Jello, it has a long history, you know, I will use a parallel like yoga in India, right, has, you know, many thousand years of history, right, similarly in Qigong is like that in China, you know, more than 5,000 years of history, so can you back to, you know, your emperor time, according to that historical record, basically, it's uh, close to 5,000 years now, so Qigong in Jello, is coming out of ancient shamanistic practice. Shamanism is really about connecting with the nature, connecting with the animal, connecting with the planets, yeah. So that kind of intuitive uh, ritual connection evolved into a system of practice. So, and the original idea is about realizing, you know, immortality. So it's, uh, on one hand, it's very practical. You know, we all want to live long, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, it's a spiritual quest. You know, what is possible? How can we become immortal, right? <laughs> so, so that is the original idea. And that is a strong idea. It's a driving force and slow the history so different system came out of that process came out of this process so what uh, people discover all the you know thousand years of history is a is a secret to longevity as human being so ultimately is also about enlightenment your full realization self-realization as a human being so in this process, many lineages come out of that. So some, um, you know, school of Taoist and Confucius and the Buddhist school and also martial art and traditional Chinese medicine. That's like five main school. And uh, only a small percentage of people in these five school know Qigong practice. And that's considered to be more like esoteric, you know, like internal alchemy, more like secretive, so to speak, uh, you know, traditionally in the history of China. And so the ancient practice of Qigong is a foundation for these different branches. So Tai Chi is from martial art tradition, obviously, yeah. The founder, the creator of Tai Chi, you know, is practiced Qigong. He's a Qigong master to begin with. Got it.
Yeah, then he discovered this particular form, working with the yin and the yang, you know, balance and, you know, uh, from soft, creating the power, you know, penetrating power. You know, the soft is stronger than the harsh qigong. So harsh qigong, so that's his discovery. And so he named this call, you know, Tai Chi. The Bodhidharma came from India, and um, he was famous for the martial art. But he's, more importantly, his contribution is brought Zen tradition from India to China. That's not well known, actually, in the West. <laughs> what we see with Zen is from, you know, uh, Japan. But actually, you know, it has much longer history in China. Their, their famous Qigong practicing Saurin Temple is the base for the martial art came out of Saurin, such as Watan uh, Jing, Yi Jin Jing, you know, eight, you know, brocules, these animal forms, and these are Qigong practice. Qigong is about awakening the energy inside of you, but more importantly, connecting with the energy of the universe as source of creation, source of life, source of your health and happiness as well with spiritual realization. So it's not about just believe, you know, there's energy or not. It's about awakening your own wisdom capacity to cultivate this energy to benefit life, yeah, starting with yourself. Then you can share the gift with others. If you go deeper, you know, beneath the martial art form is the Qigong. And Qigong, you work with energy, you can work with energy in different folks. For example, martial art folks will be focused on the power of the energy, you know, the strength of the energy, right? Using that. Then, if you're using the energy for healing, then you don't need the strength, actually, it's opposite. Using the soft energy, energy to flow and penetrate, energy to nourishing life, nourishing the cell inside of you, nourishing your heart inside of you, and you really, that's why you do really slow movement, gentle movement. So from there, you get into more meditation, more meditation. So then you go deeper, further, everything become a meditation. So in general, yeah, Qigong, yes, energetic meditation, it's energetic meditation. So what that means is, um, you know, you can do movement as a meditation. You can do breathing as a meditation. And you can do sound, vibration. I think that's relating to what you do very well. Basically, when you sing this song, making this vibration, you're practicing Qigong. <laughs> but uh, in Qigong, it's we all, you know, uh, using energy as a foundation. So whatever awareness, whatever connection you're making, the intention is always clear. You are opening to the energy. You are connecting with the energy. You are cultivating the energy. You are allowing the energy to fulfill whatever the greater potential, you know, as yourself, as human being, but also interaction, you know, in the world. So that's the kind of a unique flavor of Qigong meditation. The goal is about connecting your mind with energy. You know, in general speaking, you know, the traditional language speaking of energy is often like, okay, this is a physical dimension, you know, we're familiar with, <laughs> you know, practical, then okay, there's another dimension called spiritual dimension, and that is different from the physical dimension, practical dimension, then people continue thinking, oh, these two realms is completely different, as if they don't really coexisting with each other, so that's kind of a common deception, common tradition, common language, common assumption. Um, but actually, nowadays, you know, we realize even from scientific point of view, you know, the new discovery of quantum physics, you know, realizing the physical is made of energy. And in space, the whole universe 
is full of energy. There's nothing as a vacuum for a space. It's full of energy. And as a fact in the whole universe, yeah, only 4% is physical measurable. And the rest, 96%, is now physical. Even beyond, you know, scientific uh, measurement according to the current technology. But mathematically we know. 96% of the universe is energy power. And people, you know, science calls this as antimatters, you know, dark matters, weak forces, and so on, you know. So that is an amazing discovery. So what I mean is uh, in this whole universe, yeah, not only the physical is made of energy, but the whole universe is made of energy. So this visible body is made of invisible energy. This whole universe, whatever you see visible, yeah, is made of the invisible energy. You know, in the space, you don't see anything tangible. It's also made of energy. So the whole universe is made of energy. So once you understand that, there's no difference, there's no separation between the practical and spiritual. Between the physical and spiritual, even between, you know, <laughs> now and the future, <laughs> even the past energetically is existing in the universe, yeah. So, then we don't need to really kind of confine to this old language of, oh, this is physical, this is spiritual. It's like everything is coexisting now. So the question is, what do you want to access? Yeah. And how can you access what is existing in the universe already energetically? But our perception is based on physical. So we're ignoring what is now physical. We're ignoring, dismissing what is invisible. That's where we come to, you know, the debate of do we believe or not? This body has a capacity. Well, with it, the body is carrying the energy to begin with. When you pay attention, suddenly you're noticing, oh, the subtle level of sensation feeling, yeah. It's way beyond any explanation of physical, yeah. And the way you connect in with the universe, you know, how you meditate, how do you do this practice, how do you imagine visualizing the energy, suddenly the body is responding to this process. So it's a very tangible, personal, experiential response. You're getting the feedback, so to speak. When you go to, you know, regular yoga class in the West here, then people more focus on the physical only, breathing, you know, and fitness, you know, power, you know, I'm looking beautiful and so on. That's all good, yeah. But it's still like, really like physical, physical, physical. Forget about the invisible. Forget about the spiritual most of the time. Yeah. Occasionally, oh, we do meditating, come the mind. But the main thing is physical. Then, another tradition in yoga is like you go to a yoga guru, yeah. You practice the meditation and suddenly like, oh, I'm due. Oh, transcendental. Oh, in renunciation from all the physical. Just experiencing bliss, experience, you know, witness of the universe. So it's more like folk song transcendental. Yeah. The bridge between these two often is missed in a lot of the yoga tradition. Especially in the West. Yeah. Except, you know, Kundalini yoga still focus on the integration of both physical and spiritual. The energy you're born with as a baby, that is the creative energy of the universe. It's still inside of you, still there for you to remember, to connect, to activate, to basically express creatively in this life. And that is really about self-realization. In the subconscious level, you know, we're all looking for energy, right? 
Everybody is looking for energy, right? You know, getting energy from food, getting energy by <laughs> earning money, getting energy by, you know, acquiring resources, you know, electricity, you know, whatever it might be, you know. The whole world is fighting for energy. Basically, all the world is about ownership of energy. But when you perceiving energy only physically on planet Earth, then you see limited energy. Then everybody is fighting for it. Yeah, fighting for it. And that is very problematic. That's one of the big problems in the world. When you realizing the invisible energy of the universe is infinitely available for you. And the energy is boundless as a baby still there within you. Suddenly realizing, oh, I have all the energy I need. But the point is, Energy is conditioned from your life, from the past. So everything you have done, everything you have experienced, all the stress, yeah, all the busy thinking, all the emotional stress, all the you know life story, you know hurts, you know traumas, and the working hard, whatever these things happen, continuously conditioning your energy to the point. Right now, as what it is right now, so become conditioned energy pattern. So on one hand, our life is complex, our experience is complex, but deeply the energy pattern in the body is very simple. There's only two kind of energy pattern. One is contracted, stressed. Another is open and flowing. So when energy open flowing. Naturally, you are functioning in optimum condition in all dimensions: physical, emotional, as mental, and spiritual. And if energy is contracted, energy is still there, but it's contracted, numb, stagnant, not flowing well, then all function is compromised, including physical function of the body. You know, the feeling of the heart, emotional well-being as well. Yeah, this mental, spiritual function of your mind is also limited. So, but also I can change the limiting patterns inside me. So that is called, you know, transformation. You know, it's like uh, these um, kids nowadays growing up uh, in this video <laughs> game, right? All illustrating this energy power, right? Like boom, you know, like magic wow. But what do you use is like out of nowhere, you know, it's like you do a magic wow, you kill someone in the game, you become super power, superhuman. And that's the unfortunately, it's very misreading, very misreading. So, <laughs> so you have the power. You have to discover yourself. You have to practice. You have to make a commitment. You have a responsibility to work with the energy inside of you, the energy of the universe, and that's a responsibility as human being. And that's exciting, you know. Enjoy your day. Drive safely. Bye bye. Bye bye.